Well, let's start with uh, Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command, which, I mean, this is one of those books which when you first discover it, um, well, in my case anyway, uh, it, it was astonishing that somebody could have um, put together such an extraordinary collection of objects and produced a narrative about them. Um, this this um, completely blew my mind away when I first discovered this. This was such a, a, a revelation. It was this kind of revelation that, you know, we have a world of objects that are all to do with their impact on the human body, really, and the way in which the human body and um, deportment um, are um, um, presented is something which you can read through um, design material. You know, all these chapters about seating, um, the chair, uh, and so on, and then, you know, the stuff about water and bathing, um, the mechanization of the bath, another absolutely fantastic piece of research, completely fascinating. I have to say I was really an outsider um, with the Open University A305 and when I was invited by Tim to contribute to it, it was already well underway and they'd already made quite a lot of it. Um, so I had nothing really to contribute to the uh, devel original development of the course and the way in which it was set out. By the time I came along, it was pretty much fixed, but clearly there was something, some gap that uh, they felt they wanted to fill. Um, and I was invited really through Raina Bannum because I was then working with Raina Bannum. At the time when I contributed to it, I'd been an enthusiastic reader of Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command um, and was particularly struck by the fact that he had found a way of writing about anonymous objects and anonymous history. And that was really what I was interested in, was how you could say things about objects where there was no known designer. and. In a way, this put me at a complete opposite to most of the rest of the course, because a lot of the people in, you know, the kind of emphasis of the course was about dealing with the work of um, known or well-known designers. And to me, that wasn't particularly interesting at that time. I was not wanting to pursue that line which you know, followed through from, you know, the authorship of individuals. Uh, I was much more interested in the anonymous history. Uh, so, in a way, my position in the course as a whole was anomalous. I was an oddity because, you know, the focus of the course was, in a way, it was quite conventional architectural history. It was taking, you know, the work of canonic architects and designers um, and presenting the material in an effectively largely biographical mode through the names of, of individual um, uh, architects and authors. Um, and I, I, mean, I really didn't um, have much sympathy with that. So I was, I was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an outlier, a stranger in a way, within the way in which the, the course was, was developed. I mean, it's a surprise in a way that they wanted to do this, but I think Bannum had encouraged them to do that, to try and adopt a way of looking at history and architectural history that wasn't focused on individuals, authors, because that was something that Bannum at that time had become interested in and was, um, was keen on, was the, the um, pursuit of history 
where there were no known authors. Um, and, you know, he'd done this work on Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles book, which had come out at that time, was, you know, very much kind of dealing with the history of Los Angeles as a city that was made by uh, many people whose names were unknown. Um, so he was, he was quite critical of that, um, Tim Benton's approach to the course, I think. He wasn't entirely, uh, I mean, he was very supportive of it, but at the same time he was critical of its, uh, its in a way, quite conventional um, model of approaching history. This then was British design, one of the units in the Open University A305 course to which I contributed, and I contributed the um, section on the electric home, which was a study of ordinary things in ordinary houses, um, which set out to do something that was rather different from most of the rest of the open unit of this um, course, A A305, um, by really looking at the impact of a particular energy source, a new energy source, on domestic living and um, particularly the design of the sorts of objects that people might have found um, around the place in their homes. One of the problems about the Open University course was that most of the materials it was dealing with were things that people had never seen. So all these iconic modernist buildings that were being presented, uh, many of them, most of them were not in Britain, um, some of them were in parts of Eastern Europe that were fairly inaccessible. Um, they were not on the whole objects that most Open University students would ever have seen. So there was, you know, this difficulty about how did you engage people with experience of uh, material that they would only ever see um, at second hand through photographs or film. And I mean, this is in a way is why the OU program was so successful because it used film so um, effectively and so intelligently to introduce people to buildings. But I mean, to go back to the point about, you know, my contribution to it, I, I was in a way set up to do deal with the everyday, to deal with the material that people might actually have around them in their own homes and to think about this as uh, designed material uh, and to think about the processes through which it might have come into being and the part that it might have played in people's uh, lives. So uh, yes, you know, th there, was, there was a significant value, I think, in, in shifting the course's um, attention away from distant objects to nearby ones, to things that might um, uh, ha have at least some resonance with the student um, and uh, might become a cause of curiosity to them in the process of uh, taking the course because, you know, some of them would have been familiar with some of the sorts of things that were being illustrated here. They would recognise them um, and might not previously have thought about them as being objects of design. Um, and what I suppose I was uh, able to do was to uh, introduce them into a um, framework within which they might examine them. And then I did this radio program, um, which appears in the Radio Vision booklet here. These were radio broadcasts which were accompanied by photographs, and so there was a text 
which came over the radio and which related to the photographs. And mine was about the labour-saving home. Um, and again, it was a sort of case study of electricity uh, in the home based around this um, uh, exhibition house in Battersea in the 1930s. This is the article that I wrote about radio cabinets, which pre precedes the Open University course. This was my first um, published piece of work about um, design material, designed objects, uh, and an attempt to make sense of um, the design of everyday things, things that were familiar within everyone's house um, and home and to put together some kind of account of the um, social relations that lay behind or lay in the, these, these objects. This is um, the book which I wrote in the late 70s, Objects of Desire, which is about design and social relations and about the way in which um, design gives form to the society that we live in or aspire to live in. To think about design within a set of social relations, I wanted to see how you could treat physical objects, artefacts, as part of a social process. It overlapped to some extent with the sorts of things that cultural studies was doing, um, but it was also looking over its shoulder to what had been happening in the history of architecture um, and trying to move away from that um, concern with authorship, which was so strong in, in architecture. And at the same time, it was also trying to get away from the thing which really dominated discussions about design in Britain at that time, which was good taste. And that notion that there was some value, some particular value, which certain kinds of design represented, which was um, described as good taste in inverted commas, and which carried some kind of moral um, worth to it, which to some extent was represented by Herbert Reed's Art and Industry book. Um, so, and I wanted to see whether one could think about design as not being tied up with issues about morality, which had always tended to, um, it had always tended to attract up to then. This is probably, I think, the most long-lastingly valuable product of A305, which is this anthology of texts, um, some of them translations that were put together by the um, A305 course team um, to accompany the course. But this contains excerpts from writings by all sorts of people from the early part of the 20th century, which is as um, survives. And I think, you know, people still use this. It's, it's, it's still really valuable. And it's also good to read because of the conjunctions that occur in it. You know, things appear next to each other that you might not have thought of as um, necessarily fitting together. I think what happened in my experience is that the course might have been a whole for students of the Open University and who might have you know, taken it and read everything and seen all the programmes and studied it in its entirety. But for most of us, we plundered it. We took the bits that were useful from it. And so, for example, we recorded or had recordings of some of the television programmes and used those uh, for teaching. Um, and maybe bits of text, you know, came out of 
you know, various books, but particularly this one. So if outside, I think it survived by being um, plundered for its best bits, so to speak, uh, that it had things that you couldn't get anywhere else. And I would say of the bits that survived that this one, form and function, was the most valuable because this was a really useful anthology of texts on modern architecture and design, which you couldn't get anywhere else. It's there in a way that the A305, it survived, I would say.